Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all here this morning on this beautiful morning, and also a special welcome to our guest pastor, Pastor Joy Allemeyer. She is, was, has recently located to LaPorte from southern Indiana, so be sure and give her some of our northern Hoosier hospitality. Uh, I've got a few announcements to bring before the congregation. Okay, you need to sign up at the table for trunk or treat and to help with the carnival games and passing out candy. So anybody coming to the trunk or treat to help. Food pantry has new hours, the fourth Tuesday from two to five. So take note of those and continue your donations, I'm sure. Ida Mission Circle will be going to Rentown this Wednesday at 11.30. We'll also be doing some shopping, although I think none of us need anything. But. <laughs> Trunk or treat is Saturday, 4 to 6. And game night, Euchre, is this Saturday at 7 o'clock. So if you like to play Euchre, come on. Yes? We've changed it to 6 o'clock? Okay. Everybody take note of that. Okay. Are there any other? Oh, we got one in the back. Sherry? Okay. Sherry said we need more candy donations. Okay. Trunk or treat. I'm passing these around instead of at the table because I know we walk out and don't think about it. So I'm going to pass them around. So if you're going to bring your trunk, Decorated or undecorated, you can sign up for that. We also have pumpkin buckets, duck pond, which is Bar Mills handling. So that one's already taken. Bean bag toss, the ring toss, pull a sucker, and pumpkin bowling. So we got lots of different activities you can help with. We do need more donations for candy, so please feel free to do that. It's from 4 to 6 this Saturday. Next Sunday, is our potluck as well. It's our fifth Sunday, so church won't start till 10.30. So don't come at 9. It won't be ready yet. But at 10.30, we're going to have beef and noodles. So um, come and enjoy. Bring a dish to share. We will provide the drinks and table service, so if you can do that. The turkey supper, we're ramping up with that. We still have lots of tickets to sell. So there's lots of good places to sign up and help. So please feel free to stop and sign up. We need donations for pies and that kind of stuff as well. On the 12th, we're going to do the cranberry relish. So plan to stay after church. Come and help cranberry relish. I provide dinner for you. So it's a free meal to come and eat, enjoy, and help work. Thank you. Sue's a busy, busy girl. Uh, are there any other announcements? If not, then Pastor Joy. Good morning. You can tell I'm still trying to figure out what am I supposed to do. Okay, and we're going to do the opening prayer. If you would join me in the opening prayer this morning. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, I'm always amazed at your creation. When we take time to stop and look and see the beautiful sky as we drive to church and we see all the trees that you've made and the sun that shines on them just right at this fall season. If we really take time and stop, we are amazed at all that you have created. Father, none the least of these, us. So we give you thanks. We give you thanks for life. We give you thanks for the beauty of the earth. We give you thanks for this fall. And I give you thanks for this church and for the warm welcome I received and just the intricate ways in such a short moment you made me feel at home uh, with relationships that were connecting so quickly. Father, we thank you for the pastor of this church that is here currently, and we ask that you would be with him as he is not here this morning and bless his time away. And Father, so as we gather and as others begin to gather throughout the state of Indiana, throughout the United States this morning, and come before you to worship, may we find that our hearts are open and that our eyes are ready to see, Lord, where you are working, and our ears are ready to hear 
you speak to us today so that when we leave this place, we will know we have been in your presence and you will have felt the sweet aroma of our praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand for hymn number 92, For the Beauty of the Earth. Would you please remain standing for the call to worship? Celebrate God's love, which has been poured into your life. Reach out and care for those around you. Shout for joy. Amen. You may be seated. I don't see any children for a children's sermon. Okay. So I have the offering.
Heavenly Father, Lord, we lift up to you these gifts of tithes and offerings. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us this week. We have had food to eat. We've had a place to sleep. We have a beautiful place to worship. And so, Lord, we ask that as we are thankful, we will give out of our abundance and out of our thankful hearts the first fruits, as well as as times arise where there is more needed, that we would be generous in giving and be joyful givers. So thank you again, Lord. We ask a blessing upon this specific offering and on the work that it will do for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Very well. may be seated. I may have done things out of order for you since I've not been here before because I see there is a pastoral prayer following that with... The Our Father. So instead of missing that opportunity for you to pray with me, um, are there those that you have that you would lift up before the body that you would like us to pray for this morning? Any praises? Anything good happened in your life this week? Yes. Wow. And was that a community thing? Yes. Our uh, something have started to do annually, and uh, uh, very successful, very successful. Very good. Yeah. Wonderful. And now everybody's got a sugar high this morning, right? <laughs> sugar comas, yes. Okay. The back that is a great blessing, isn't it? When we are so vulnerable and we feel so vulnerable with our parents and, and their safety. So we praise God for that. Thank you. I'm thankful to be with you this morning and to have such a warm welcome. I mean, I'm in awe, not only of how friendly from the very moment I got out of my car and was greeted and shown where things were and the quick connections I made there, but I was just, I brought, see, you know, I, I know what it's like for preachers that get dry in the mouth, and so I brought my own drink, and I get here, and I see you have a glass of ice water for me. I'm like in awe. So whoever that person was that offered the cup of cold water, thank you, and I am an ice person, so I love the fact that it has ice in it. I'm in awe. What a, a beautiful congregation and welcoming you are. Thank you. Okay, well, I know there are many on your hearts that sometimes it's not comfortable to say in a congregation or appropriate, even sometimes. Um, not everything we come here with this morning is easy, is it? There are many of us um, that are battling other things in our life. And we definitely have a world that has wars, rumors of wars. Um, we have tanks over now. You know, our, our air, my husband told me like that. Ford and the Eisenhower are now over in the seas over there positioned with aircraft. And so I know I have a daughter traveling today, and I woke up to a text of, of saying, I have never felt so afraid. Even the time that I was in Israel in a bad situation, I have never been so afraid as I am here in New Mexico at a gas station. And, and um, as she was leaving from business training and coming home, and she goes, and that's saying a lot, Mom. She goes, I, I feel like I shouldn't even leave Indiana anymore. And so we sometimes live in a bubble, don't we? Sometimes those things, we can be in a, a good place and feel safe, but somewhere this morning there is somebody who's terrified. And um, so let's pray for all aspects of our life today as we come together in prayer and open in prayer. And then I will ask you to uh, join me at the end in the Lord's Prayer. So let's take a few moments and bow our heads. Um. Oh, Lord, you know that piano music has always been the one thing that touches my heart more than anything else. What a joy. What an absolute gift this morning this pianist is to my heart. As she leads us into near the heart of God, I know that hymn so well. It's one from my childhood. We do want to be near your heart this morning. We want to be so close we hear your heartbeat. 
And yet, there are moments and days where we feel so far away that we wonder if you even care. It feels like you're still asleep in that boat while the storm rages around us. I'm reminded of that. Father, we know there is so much more for us to be thankful for than there is for us to complain about, and yet <laughs> we complain. <laughs> and yet you love us. I'm amazed by that. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us people to gather together that love you and love each other. Thank you for the ways that you've heard our prayers this morning, the prayers of the people. Not just the ones spoken this morning, but Lord, the ones that are still quietly in their hearts and in their minds that they're lifting up. So for all the thanksgiving of even the people at the trunk retreat, just the groves and groves of people that came through, may they find that in your churches and in your people who know you, that you are sweeter than any candy that could be offered. May they find that the shadow of Halloween, because that's all it is, it's a shadow of that which is supposed to be a hallowed day where we celebrate your saints. May it lead them to somehow ponder what, why do we do this? And may, Lord, your people shine at a time of darkness and need. We pray that all those in the community that do not know you yet, that, Father, they would begin to hear, that you would strengthen our hearts, that you would make us not fall asleep, <laughs> but be awake, to wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead so that Christ will shine on us. Lord, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of being so blessed that I take things for granted, food to eat, a light switch that when I turn it on just comes on automatically water that I'm sure will be there when I just turn on the faucet. And yet, Lord, we know that is not the reality for every person on earth. So God, in our times of abundance, may we be thankful first and foremost. And may we never forget and take it for granted. And when we do, repent of that. And then ask, Lord, how we might be a blessing to others who do not have. So, Lord, for those children who are terrified this morning that don't have a safe home in which to live, whether it be because their parents are struggling with alcohol or whether it be because their parents are deceased and they're in a children's home or whether it be because they're overseas and in the midst of war, we ask that your presence would be near, that they would have an abundance of your spirit more than we do this morning, that you would make a way we pray for those who are struggling and contemplating today, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know what's next. Or the fear of an unknown cancer that may have just crapped up. God, in all these things, we know you are able. You are bigger than our little tiny realities. So open our hearts this morning to see that. And Lord, as we gather together, for generations and years and years of discipleship. We asked you, your disciples asked you years ago while you walked this earth to teach them to pray. And then you gave us a prayer through your son, Jesus Christ. So Lord, as we, your people now, say those words, may they take root in our heart this morning. And may we join with the generations of believers, those many who have already are with you in heaven, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
please remain seated and join in the hymn number 64, Holy, Holy, Holy. Please forgive me for being a little head before. <laughs> uh, would you now please stand as you're able for the scripture reading? Our scripture this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. 
You may be seated, I guess. Well, good morning. Um, again, it's a privilege to be with you this morning. Um, I know your pastor when he was a college student. He was young. He was one of the young adults in the church that my husband was serving at the time in uh, southern Indiana. Uh, I know the joke used to be what you could could be, it was amazing you could still be in Indiana and be as far farther west than Chicago and yet south of Louisville and still be in. And that's that little toe of, of Indiana that um, we were serving in and that your pastor came from. And so it was a great joy that there was somebody we knew when we came north. And he was gracious and he and his wife had us over and we played some games with them. And then when he said, I called the district office and they said you'd fill in. And I was like, yeah, actually I will. <laughs> um, I am the associate pastor at my husband's church uh, because I'm a local pastor. I'm not an elder like your, your pastor or my husband. Um, I'm taking course of study and have served churches off and on throughout my husband's ministry. But my day job is a conference assistant. So in your district, your district is Eva Gobe. In the south and southwest, they know Joy Allemeyer. So I am still doing that job from a distance now. So I serve Mitch Gisselman, the conference superintendent, by day. And then I serve my husband in the Laporte First Church in the evenings and weekends. Um, and it's a joy. But I must tell you, has your world been rocked lately? Have you been somebody that... This world got shaken up, that everything seemed to be going really well, and then, do you remember a time like that? Have you ever had an experience like that? Everyone goes through times like that, don't they? Whether it be a spouse dies very unexpectedly, and it just shakes your world up. Or you find out you're pregnant, and you are not ready for a child. And all of a sudden, you have a child, <laughs> and it's coming in nine months, so you better be prepared. Or maybe what shook your world was your son became a minister and moved so far away, and you had to move all the way from the south to the north if you wanted a relationship with him or if you wanted the brothers to still know each other. Well, when I signed up to marry my husband, he was a military policeman. He was not a pastor, but I knew in my heart of hearts he would be a pastor someday. I didn't grow up United Methodist. But... It was a great joy. I loved, I grew up in Hammond, so I really am a northerner deep down. I come from the southern roots of Alabama. My family moved up here when they had six children and they moved to, to Gary and eventually over to Hammond. And then eventually, when I, I was born years later, eventually we found our way to Columbus, Indiana, and I've been in the southern part of the state for so long that when we told we were coming back north, I was like, oh, I don't know how to be a northerner anymore. And my husband definitely never, ever, ever, ever in his life thought he would live north of Indianapolis. When he signed up to be a pastor, we were just south and north Indiana conferences, right? And so he was guaranteed he would never go past north of Indy. And it was quite the shock. You see, I had gotten comfortable I loved itinerancy. I didn't mind it. I had been married to a soldier. We were itinerant. We lived in Germany. We lived in Kentucky. We lived in Tennessee. But there comes a point in life as we age and we have children, and I never thought I'd have the blessing of having my children live near me, and definitely not the blessing of grandchildren. But in our last assignment, we thought that would be our last. We thought we would retire there in Santa Claus, Indiana. We had no idea COVID was coming, and we had no idea that disaffiliations of United Methodist Churches were coming. That was not something we could foresee in our future. And so our son was our music minister, and so that meant my grandchildren, every time they were born, were right there in the church. Every Sunday I would walk into church and hear, Nana, and the arms would open up and come running. All of that to paint a picture for you that for nine years I had my grandchildren and my son in my world, and then my daughter decided she would move to town too. Just two doors from my son, right around the lake from us, everything seemed perfect. Everything seemed perfect. Until it wasn't. My mother passed away last October 28th. The church decided to vote on disaffiliation. My husband had a stint put in his heart. A week later, he gets out of the hospital. My mother-in-law has a stroke in Columbus, Indiana. 
My world continued to spin. I was a conference assistant. I was watching the ugliness of both sides of the church. And my world began to spin. And there was no time for grief. No time for grief. And then I'm moving 289 miles away from my beautiful grandchildren. And no longer would I have them every Friday. And we no longer would we go to the beautiful nursing home and sing a concert once a week where they love the older people. And the older people love the hugs of those children. We had our own little family band. So much so that when my daughter turned, my daughter, I call her my daughter, she's really my granddaughter. My granddaughter turned 10, she looks just like my daughter, so I have a hard time. I get their names mixed up, Evelyn and Echo. You ever do that with your family members? So much that when I asked Evelyn what she wanted for her birthday when she was 10, do you know what she said? I want to go to the nursing home, and I want to sing for them, and I want to hug them. So for her 10th birthday, we drove all the way back 289 miles, we picked up her and her siblings and another little girl in the church that was a part of our family band, and we took them over to the nursing home, and the people just were so excited. Has your world ever been turned upside down? Maybe you haven't had to move, but maybe you've had a diagnosis of cancer. Or like I say, you've just gone through a depression, or your church just doesn't feel the same anymore because you don't have the same culture that surrounds you and we wonder where have all the children gone where have all the young adults gone they come out for halloween but where are they on sunday morning does your world feel strange today with iraq and iran and the the whole wars in ukraine and the threat of war in jerusalem and israel and gaza and in times like these is what came to mind for me and so I asked for this reading because when, when I accepted to preach, I wasn't really struggling, but the grief began to hit me. It just be, finally caught up with me. It all just finally hit me that I hadn't had time to grieve my mother's death, the change. And then I was like, why did I accept to preach? Yeah, my name's Joy, and I'm usually joyful. Why did I accept to preach? Because I don't feel it right now. I'm feeling like a storm inside me is raging. And so it was interesting that God had given me this scripture, <laughs> that anybody who hears the words of him, you see the storm is going to come. And if you put the words you hear from God into practice, you'll be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. That rock's Jesus, right? God, he is, he is the cornerstone, Jesus is, it says, that the builders rejected. The rain comes down and the streams rise and the winds beat against that house, and yet it did not fall. I was saying to my husband last night as I reread it before we went to sleep, you know, it doesn't say, though, that it didn't get tattered, does it? It doesn't say that water didn't come in the window. It doesn't say that the siding didn't blow off. It doesn't tell us what state the house was in after that storm hit. It just says it did not fall. Why? Because its foundation was good. Its foundation was on the rock. And so everyone who puts these words of mine and does, and puts them into, and does not put them into practice, they're going to be the opposite, right? Do you remember that song as a child, right? The rains came down and the floods came up. Did you guys sing that as Methodists? In this? Okay. I grew up Southern Baptist, so I'm not always sure what things are Methodist, what things are Baptist, and what things are universal. My husband and I joke about that all the time. But the rains came down and the floods came up. And it says, and you always loved as a child when you got to that part, and the foolish man built his house upon the sand, and when the rains came down and the floods came up, it went, and you did a big clap, right? Splat! And yet, that joyful children's splat was really kind of sad, wasn't it? Because that house fell with a great crash. People around us are falling with a great crash. We had a youth lock-in, and Tim and I decided we were going to try to connect with the children here. These children are different at this church that we're at than the children we just came from. They're in a bubble in Santa Claus. They are, they are in a bubble. And we were lost. At All of these kids had IEPs. All of them had a special education diagnosis. 
All of them had a different challenge that we have never had to face in dealing with children, and we found ourselves. Every child, the first child I'm talking to, the young girl says, my dad's an alcoholic, and I'm just glad to be somewhere but home tonight, because every night I come home to, he doesn't work, he may not, I might ask him a question and he won't speak to me for 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and then I'm not afraid of the answer I'm going to get. And we're just, you know, and it was child after child that was struggling with something major. And when you ask the normal questions, the para, you know, the youth minister was doing a wonderful job on a sermon called Paradox about how you can be weak and yet be strong. And um, she was doing this and it's resonated with me as, you know, you can, you know, how you can be small and yet have great strength. But she asked them, she asked them the question, you know, what does that mean? In my weakness, he can be strong. What does it mean to be strong? What do you think of when you think of strength? You know, when I was growing up, the first thing everybody would have said, what would you have said? What would you say when you think of strong? What do you think of? Physical what? Physical strength. Everybody immediately, Hulk Hogan or, or, you know, some great boxer or we think of somebody with muscles. There was only one kid who said abs. She thought of some, you know, somebody with great abs. Arnold Schwarzenegger, whatever. But do you know what most of these kids said? And it bothered me. Emotional strength, mental strength. They have been so traumatized by COVID and by that the schools have spent so much time teaching them about emotional strength, which I was not witnessing, and mental strength, and all of that, that they're trying to build these children back up. And I just thought, where have I landed? Where have I landed? That they're just not joyful children that immediately think of, you know, David and Goliath, and David the shepherd boy going and killing Goliath. And then I thought about my world and how it's been rocked. You see, uh, I grew too comfortable as a Christian. Oh, I still was working with children. We had 20 children every, every Wednesday night that we joyfully had what's called PT's Rangers. And we, we still were very active in the church, and we were still doing God's work, and we were going to the nursing home, and then we were singing. But I'm going to tell you, I wasn't praying the way I should have been praying. I wasn't aware of what was going on outside of my bubble. I wasn't really saying, God, there are still lost souls in this community. How do we reach them? There are children, even in that community, we weren't seeing. We were so busy enjoying the children of affluence or middle class that we were not paying attention well enough to the children who were like these children who don't know the church, don't know Jesus Christ, whose families are torn and ripped apart by everything that's happened. And so... My spirit had to be shaken up. <laughs> Our God used the shake-up to wake me up. Um, are you all familiar with the revival that happened at Asbury College? Did it make it here? Is this a church that actually was awake and heard about it? And how people were coming from all over to get back to that college from all parts of the world? They're all looking at me blank stares. Does that mean none of you heard about the revival at Asbury and didn't tune in online to YouTube and everything to watch it and how there were so many people the town couldn't handle it that they had to shut it down? The government came in and said we don't have enough food in the town or parking in the town or everything as a revival began to happen at the Asbury College like it did previously. That they had to shut it down. And they were just coming 24-7 and singing and praising God and hearing and being healed and hearing God's voice. And churches were so longing for it, they began to flock there to find out where, why is the Spirit settling there? Well, I say that because God used them without knowing it. <laughs> I was hearing about it. We were watching it. We were contemplating going ourselves, my friend and I, to see it. We watched it online some. And we were hungry. We were thirsty for an outpouring of the Spirit. Hungry as all of this crazy stuff was going on. And as we 
began to say, we need to pray more. We need to wake up, and that needs to be the experience. We need to wake it. The scripture verse that Seedbed Ministries uses, that's my daily devotion now. Seedbed, a man who taught at the university, went to that university, was a part of this revival movement. He's my age or older. He's a pastor. I don't know where he's serving now. He may be Global Methodist. I don't know what, what church he serves. But J.D. Walt, he has a ministry called Seedbed. And Seedbed, they send out a, a link every day, devotional link, and talk about this revival and, and, and just trying to wake the Christians up. Their favorite verse is, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And so we're in the book of Acts right now, and every day it comes. And for the longest time, I didn't realize I could click on the audio link. The audio is much better than reading it. And I hear it in his voice, or the witness on Saturday's voice of telling their Holy Spirit story. But what happened was when my world was shaken and I knew we were moving, and I didn't know how we were going to do this, I began to cry out to God, God, where are you? Where, where are you? What, what is happening to my world? And I began to get so sorrowful with everything I was experiencing. I would literally, I'd be in the middle of approving a charge conference form, and next thing I'd be on the floor crying, praying. God, what, you know, last year with my mother's death, with everything happening. And if you go into verse, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a few more minutes. Go over in chapter 8, just a little farther down. And we came to the point where Jesus calms the storm. Jesus is in a boat with his disciples. He had just finished this teaching on the wise and the foolish man. And the crowds were amazed at his teaching. It doesn't say they began to follow it, just as they were amazed at it. They weren't, didn't, yet, didn't say they went and put it into practice. They were still just listening. And then we find he comes down off that mountain and he meets the centurion and he, we witness the faith of the centurion and we witness Jesus healing people so that they began to flock to him even more that he has to go out on a boat. So he goes out on a boat with his disciples and you know this one very well. He's asleep. <laughs> He's asleep, it says. And the waves are sweeping over the boats, chapter 8, verse 23. And that's what my world felt like. Jesus was asleep. He was asleep in the boat. Doesn't he wake up and know what's going on in my world? Lord, save us. They went and woke him up. We're going to drown. And he replied, oh, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? He got up, he rebukes the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And then I thought, so what was the right response? I began to question God. What was the right response? Should I not wake you up? <laughs> Should I not say, God, where are you? Am I just supposed to curl up next to you and go to sleep and just let the storm happen? What, what was the right response? I don't know that I've ever heard a preacher tell me what the right response of faith was that day. <laughs> I just know that I didn't have the faith I was supposed to have, and I needed Jesus to wake up in my life. Well, really, I was the one asleep. He's awake. <laughs> God's spirit's always present, and he already knew. It wasn't his time yet, so he was sleeping peacefully. The disciples didn't know yet. If they did, they'd have just been like, eh, it's not his time yet. Waves aren't going to get him. We can just curl up right next to him. But you see, as humans, we don't have that kind of divine insight all the time, do we? We don't always see. And so in my storm, I began with a friend to pray. And we attended one of the seed bed. I was so hopeful. They put out a thing on how to pray. And I went to that, and they were so busy talking about the revival, they didn't really teach on the subject they were supposed to teach on. But they mailed me a resource that wasn't theirs that led me to the 24-7 prayer movement. And I encourage you. To read that book, How to Pray, what did the disciples ask Jesus? Teach us how to pray. Church, we've got to wake up. And if you're happy and everything's perfect in your world right now, thank God. <laughs> Don't, I'm serious, thank God. If nothing in your world, if your health is perfect, all your friends are fine, your kids are fine, your church is thriving, everything is fine in your world, then just be thankful and give constant praise to God. But if it's troubling you, if you are troubled by something, whether it be the state of our church, whether it be the state of my marriage, whether it be the state of my health, God is going to use it to wake you up to say, he's here, but we're not listening very well. So God led me to a resource that's how to pray. 
by Pete Gregg, I think is his name. And there's free YouTube videos. If you like to watch it, you can watch the videos, like eight of them. I know uh, your pastor's mother, Putty, has been coming over and doing this study with me. Uh, does it change your view? It rocks your world about prayer is more than just a laundry list of please bless so-and-so, please bless so-and-so, please bless so-and-so. It's a communication with God in which we also listen. God, what are you saying? So instead of me asking, where are you, God? Pete taught me to say, instead of why, where are you? I say, I've already learned it so well, I'm saying it right. I'm saying, where are you, God? I wasn't saying, where are you, God? I was saying, why, God? Why is this happening? Why is this going on in my world? But now I've learned to say, where are you? Show me where you are going to show up. This message went nowhere where I planned for it to go. If you saw my notes, if you saw my notes, we were going about the anchor that goes before us. It, this did not go anywhere. I'm sorry. Maybe that's the Holy Spirit. I hope it was the Holy Spirit. But what the song, the final song I want to leave you with that Music speaks to me. I don't know about you, but I'm telling you, you blessed my heart today. God used you in a way that touches my soul, and I feel God in you as you play. You have a blessing. Your hands are a blessing. Your spirit is a blessing to my. Thank you for ministering to me this morning. So when I am hurting or whether I'm joyful, my mother said she could always tell what mood I was in when I came home from school. She had a business in the basement of our house, another story. But there was an old piano left in our rental house, and I would come straight to that piano. And if I was mad, boy, I hammered those keys. You do that too? You can tell what mood I was in. If I was happy, it was light and joyful. Songs that I learned in my childhood began to flood back. And this one is the one that flooded back this week. And that's the reason for the, the uh, title. In times like these, you need a savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. She wrote this during World War II. And my church adopted this hymn and sang it a lot. I didn't realize. I was telling your pastor, I said, do you know this hymn? Any chance we could, you know, and he was like, I, and I said it was an old hymn. And then I looked it up and I thought, oh, Methodist, you know, your old hymns are not 1700, 1800. This was written in what, you know, 1945, 50, somewhere. Times like these, you need a savior. So in times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips a solid rock. Times like these, I have a savior. In times like these, I have an anchor. I'm very sure, I'm very sure. My anchor holds and grips the solid rock. And God woke me up and said, Joy, what are you trusting in? Are you trusting in your family? Are you trusting in a retirement? Are you trusting in your health? What are you trusting in? You used to trust in me. You used to not care if you had a retirement. You used to not care if you owned a house. Of course, I didn't even know what it was like to have grandchildren until they came. Wow. But I knew what it was like to have children. You used to not be so anchored to the things of this world. You used to be anchored mainly on me. And if I said go, you went. And he shook me up. And so here we are in the north. We're one of you. Woo! <laughs> and you've been very welcoming. And I thank you for that. And I find it was crazy, the connection with Karen, right? Karen this morning, and a quick conversation she overhears as we're introducing ourselves and find out that her sister attends church with my mother-in-law, and her other sister lived next door to some friends of ours from Santa Claus and Sebring. I mean, that's crazy. (laughs) God weaves things. But folks, I want to encourage you, if you're not praying and learning about prayer and asking God to teach you how to pray, do it. Because we've not seen the last of troubled times, and our world's hurting. I'm hurting. Our world's hurting. We need an anchor. We need to hear from God. And we need to know 
what our marching orders are. And we need to know for certain that our hand is in his and that he holds tomorrow. And I know who holds my hand. Yeah, that's another hymn. I love songs. Thank you. Thank you for being the people of God, choosing to wake up this morning, choosing to gather here, have fellowship, love each other, and not give up. Because this church matters. You matter to the kingdom. And God's not done. Amen. Would you stand as you are able and join in singing hymn number 399. And now may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And may God give you and the rest of the world peace. Amen. Go in peace.
any of it. 